Oh, snap, y'all. Here we go again. The Red Hot Chili Peppers. The godfathers of funk rock. The kings of California. Since 1983, these four guys, and well, way more than four guys, have blazed trails in rock, dominated the charts, and have won just so many awards. All of the awards. Look at all these awards they've won. There's a California Music Award? That feels like cheating. The Peppers are legends. And however you feel about them, it's hard to deny the influence and impact they've had on music over the past 30 plus years. And with a brand new album on the horizon, these guys have shown no signs of slowing down. But again, like any band that's been around for nearly 40 years, when you look at their back catalog... <laughs> That can be a little intimidating. There is just an ocean of material from these guys that spans different eras, different genres, different vibes and moods. It can be a lot to take in, but that's why this series exists. So if you'll allow me, I'd love to show you how to get into the Red Hot Chili Peppers. So one topic we're just gonna have to discuss more than a few times is the subject of lineups. The Peppers are a band that have gone through many, many different incarnations, and each lineup has its own distinct sound and style. But in my opinion at least, the Peppers, they have what I like to call a sweet spot. A specific moment in their discography where they are at their absolute peak. Where everything is clicking and everything just works best. There's one little area where this band just sounds the sweetest. Now it's definitely debatable, but to me, the Pepper Sweet Spot basically starts at around 1989 and ends at around 2002 or so. Okay, that's 13 years. That's not really a sweet spot so much as a sweet canyon. To me, at least, Sweet Spot Peppers starts in 1989 when a certain 18-year-old kid from Queens stumbles his way into the role of lead guitarist. To me, the Peppers' true winning streak starts right here at Mother's Milk. Y'all, I love this record. I'd argue this was the true genesis of the Peppers, at least the Peppers we know and love today. This was the first album where the cohesion between everyone is close to perfect. And the thing I love most about this record too is just how absolutely fucking insane it is. <laughs> touch on this a bit later, but when the Peppers started out, their sound was actually not the most rocky out there. Their stuff was more influenced by 70s funk and 80s hip-hop. Very Parliament Funkadelic, very Run DMC, that kind of vibe. Early Peppers... ...is a bit of a different animal. The elements of punk and hard rock were always there, but the mix between the genres wasn't exactly a smooth blend around this particular era. But here on Mother's Milk, ooh, 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 it just, it starts clicking. They start getting how to blend everything together well. It starts really sounding like the Peppers. Flea's bass finally feels like it's being pushed to the right level of loudness and bombastness. Anthony finally begins to exude some real confidence in his singing voice. And most importantly on this record, John freaking Frusciante. <laughs> oh. 
this guy is 18 years old on this record. 18 years old! How good were you at guitar? I know I was shit. He absolutely steps up to the plate. His riffing is intense, speedy, and chaotic, but also very harmonious and pleasant in all the right places. This record is arguably their hardest and heaviest record. It's definitely the most a psychotic feeling. I mean, the Peppers do have their heavy moments, but they were never the outright heaviest band in the world, nor did they really aspire to be. But this record, oh my god, people, just cruncher after cruncher after cruncher. From the opening slam fest, Good Time Boys, to the drug trip of Nobody Weird Like Me. <laughs> are these bass lines? <laughs> to the affirming and uplifting Knock Me Down, to the furious Stone Cold Bush, hell, even their cover of Jimi Hendrix Fire, which... Okay, let me slip it up inside your fire! Sounds like it's being played at four times speed. God damn! The Hendrix version, Fire, is, you know, used as a metaphor for sex. This song makes it sound like they literally are trying to have sex with fire. Hell, even their cover of Stevie Wonder's Higher Ground is absolutely brilliant. I'd argue it's debatably better than the original. Flea replaces the signature keyboard riff with his trademark slappy as fuck bass line and. Yeah, y'all, this kicks ass. And are those stuffed animal pants? I want those stuffed animal pants. Give me your pants, Flea. That's one of the other things I adore about this record. It feels like the bridge between the more modern peppers we all know and love today and the classic goofy doofus party animal peppers of the past. It's got the silly, carefree, dumb fun of their previous work, but it also shows some real sonic growth and development and maturity. Even the interlude, Pretty Little Diddy, written as a joke because Anthony, quote, didn't like doing pretty songs. Man, even on a throwaway track like this, you can just hear uh, the talent and the underlying potential in this track. Like, God, something this, you know, half-hearted should not be this fucking stellar. Even if the song's main riff, uh... Come, my lady, come, come, my lady. You're my butterfly, sugar. God damn it, Crazy Town. This record is just an absolute wild animal. Listening to this thing feels like being in the center of a tornado. Though part of that, sadly, had to do with where the band was emotionally at the time. More on that a little later. But it's also because of tension in the studio. Uh, this is a great example of a record that sounds great, but it was an absolute mess to get made. There was a lot of clashing with producer Michael Beinhorn, who'd worked with them previously on Uplift Mofo Party Plan. His original goal on this record was to make a more metallic Peppers sound. And... <laughs> I guess he did kinda get his wish with all the energy and aggression on this one, but it led to him and the band clashing a lot in the studio, particularly him and John. He tried to get John to add a bunch of distortion effects to his guitar sound, and he also pressured Anthony into writing more radio-friendly, mainstreamy, dumb it down for the masses kind of melodies. And I mean Chili Peppers don't need to be made more dumb, if you know what I mean. The vibe recording this one was definitely sour, and it shows up on the record, honestly. But despite all that, they still pumped out a back-to-front classic. I feel like this album gets a little overshadowed these days, primarily because of the absolute brilliance they would release later on in their career, but the initial winning streak totally starts here at Mother's Milk. 
and while the chaos of the recording process definitely sounds like it sucked, it was the impetus for the band to start seeking out a new producer they could work with more effectively. Enter Rick Rubin. Well, I'm sailing. Oh my god, blood sugar sex magic. Where in the sweet hell do I even begin with blood sugar sex magic? I mean, chances are, if you've heard anything from this band at all, it's from this record right here. Y'all, this isn't just a good record, it's easily their most celebrated. And this isn't the kind of album that's just celebrated within their catalog. This album is often put up there with the greatest albums of all time. I, I mean, look at all the hype for this thing. Nothing lives up to that much hype, right? Yeah, this album gets a lot of love, but in my opinion, not an ounce of it is misplaced. Released on September 24th, 1991, the exact same day as Nevermind. Imagine having to put up a fight against fucking Nevermind and still holding your own, like, golf clap. Goddamn, that's just how much of a boss this record is. And it's insane how well this thing holds up to. So many of these songs have not just become classic rock staples, but staples in American music as a whole. Give it away, suck my kiss, under the bridge, breaking the girl, if you have to ask. And those are just the songs people know about. Even the deep cuts like The Power of Equality, The Righteous and the Wicked, I Could Have Lied, Apache Rose Peacock, all of them just stomping, powerful, colorful, introspective. Like, ugh, I, I know I'm gushing, but like, this album has fucking everything on it. It tries everything and it kills at everything it tries to do. Hell, even the B-sides kick ass. Soul to Squeeze, a B-side taken from this album and later used as part of the Conehead soundtrack. Maybe one of my favorite Chili Pepper songs ever. It's been on my I love this song potentials for ages. Hell, I'll probably get around to making that video one day. But the short version, it's one of the best ballads this band would ever write. And it's just, just a goddamn dream. This song alone makes the Conehead soundtrack worth picking up. And like, y'all, here are some examples of what else is on the Conehead soundtrack. What in the actual? There aren't many albums I'd call perfect, but when it comes to Blood Sugar Sex Magic, it gets about as close as you can possibly get in my opinion. I feel like I could make I Love This songs on like three quarters of the damn track list and this is a long album too. I kinda hope you don't need me to tell you to check this album out, but in case you did, yes, absolutely go for it. If there was gonna be one Red Hot Chili Peppers record that should be your first, it would probably be this one. It's just, so good. So, so good. I need to try to stop kissing this album's ass. I mean, it's not absolutely perfect. There are some things about it I don't necessarily care for. The production style, while pitch perfect for its time, does feel a teensy bit dated today. And if there's one thing that'll turn you off of this album, and I guess the Peppers as a whole, um... It's their deep inside, the garden of Eden. Standing out with my heart all bleeding and the devil in my dick. Hell, some fever in my semen. Unique approach to lyrics. I mean, you know, the lyrics have always been kind of a sticking point for some folks. And on this record, um. That cop she was all dressed in blue with your pizza. But I'm telling you, she stuck my butt with the big black stick. Yeah, it definitely has its moments. Anthony, when we say fuck the police, we don't mean literally, dude. I don't care how good the sex was, that's police brutality. But for every one moment that doesn't hit, there are five or six 
brilliant moments that make up for it. And honestly, I'd say even the goofier moments are more than balanced out by songs like I Could've Lied, Under the Bridge, and My Lonely Man. Again, this is just a record that tries everything and gets everything right. Those are a rare fucking breed, y'all. I won't lie, my love for this one is at least partially sentimental. This was the third album I ever purchased all the way back when I was six years old. And like Pearl Jam's 10 before it, this is another one of those albums that got me into music. Like this is one of the reasons I'm here, y'all. Y'all got my goofy ass to deal with because of brilliant stuff like this. 1991 was a complete upheaval of the American music scene, and this record was an important catalyst in that transformation. Praised by fans and critics alike, this record was, and in many cases still is, heralded as the best thing the Peppers would ever make. Like, nothing was gonna possibly top this. Enter Californication. Oh, y'all, Californication. Okay, remember nearly everything I said about Blood Sugar Sex Magic? If I really wanted to, I could say almost everything that I said about that about Californication, too. It's another record that's massively celebrated by both fans and critics alike. It's an album that deserves the reputation it gets because it's absolute bliss from beginning to end. It's a record where I could make <laughs> entire videos on most of its track list, they're so good. While both of these albums are huge milestones in their career, I feel like they stand out for almost polar opposite reasons. The difference is in tone. While Blood Sugar Sex Magic is a brilliant record, it is, at the end of the day, a fairly prototypical Peppers record. It was just the Peppers formula that they'd been working on since the 80s, fine-tuned and sharpened to a perfect final form. It's the record where the Peppers formula just kind of works the best. But this album here, this proved to us that the Peppers, they don't even need a formula to be fantastic, y'all. And one of the most notable things about Californication is the return of John Frusciante. Again, since I'm telling this story out of order, apologies if it's a little hard to keep up, but try to follow along here. John had actually left the group during the Blood Sugar Sex Magic tour, and when he exited the group, he decided to spend time away from music and spend a lot more time with heroin. Oh dear. And in his absence, the band were experimenting with a different guitarist, with a different style and approach. We'll get to it. By 1998, though, things had fallen apart with John replacement, and John was able to get some much, much needed treatment, and after some talks with the band, John was welcomed back into the fold and started writing music with the guys again. And y'all... <laughs> it is a night and day difference in sound, even from John's previous work, y'all. Their last record had them experimenting with a lot of heavy metal and acid rock, but John actually convinced the guys to start writing from a more mellow, prog rock standpoint. And man, the music just takes on so much more texture and feeling and just like raw ass, Beauty? Like, this is a beautiful, beautiful record. That core riff in Scar Tissue with its beautifully sparse melodies and soloing, the trickling and subdued verses in the title track, the soberly gorgeous acoustic pickings on Road Trippin'. It's an album that's so much more peaceful and spiritually light feeling. Not that this album doesn't have its heavier moments. <laughs> 
fuck. Any album that opens with something as heavy as Around the World gets a 10 out of 10 in my book. But even its crunchier moments are often punctuated by some genuinely striking instrumentation. Those glowing choruses on Around the World, those glittery chimes on Savior, the carefree solo on I Like Dirt. Again, it's another album like Blood Sugar Sex Magic that tries everything but succeeds at everything it tries. Even lyrically, this album is... Well, again, it's, uh... It is still a Peppers record. Why would you want to win that? But a lot of the themes they tackle here feel much more... mature. Even on Blood Sugar Sex Magic, the whole funky monk, crazy caveman mentality was still there, but here, the mood in general, you can just tell these guys have been through the ringer more than a few times. They've had a lot of hard years and have had to learn some very hard lessons. Tonally, this album feels battle-scarred, worldly-wise, and genuinely weathered more weathered than Creed ever was, at least. This sounds almost like an entirely different band here. They sound like they've matured 10 years in only four. It's another album I'd argue is just so close to perfect from back to front. Another wow kind of record. There isn't a single minute of wasted time, wasted space, or wasted energy. Maybe a few wasted lyrics. Whatever, that comes with the territory with this band. Y'all just kinda gotta swallow that pill if you're gonna enjoy this group, I'm sorry. But overall, I feel like this was the album that once and for all proved that the Peppers were more than just goofballs. They were a band that could grow, shift, and transform, and still remain consistently brilliant throughout every transformation they could make. This was the album that showed the world that the Red Hot Chili Peppers were here to stay. And in my opinion, you must, must try to hear this one if you have even a fleeting interest in this band. And while that may be controversial in and of itself, um, even more controversially, I would say almost the exact same thing about their follow-up to that record, by the way. Oh, by the way, this record is kind of a weird note in their general discography. It was their first record of the 2000s, it immediately came after Californication, and it still carries over a lot of those thoughtful vibes that that album had. And you know, it's not like it wasn't celebrated, it did score a decent amount of success, and people do look back fondly on this one 20 years later, but... Like, not to the same degree as a lot of the other Peppers albums, honestly. It's not a record that has any real, like, backlash or hate or anything, but it's often thought of as, like, kind of an also-ran in their catalog. It's like, yeah, I remember, by the way, yeah, by the way, that's, that is certainly a record that, that is. I will not contest that. It's not a record you see a lot of people jumping up and down over, but, y'all hot take? This might be one of my personal favorites in their entire discography. No shit. While I do have more history with records like Blood Sugar Sex Magic and Californication, maybe even more emotional attachment to those records, when it comes to just pure, raw, unfiltered chili peppers fun, I always go for this one. When I'm in the mood for Red Hot Chili Peppers and I just don't know what I want to throw on, I usually find myself going to this one because you know what? It's just a rip-roaring little blast. To me, this is their most reliable record. It's a real workhorse of an album. It's one you can throw on over and over and over again, and even if it's not your favorite, you're always gonna have a really, really good time with it. And part of the reason why that is is just because of how 
screamingly pleasant this record is. Like, this record is just a fucking ray of sunshine, y'all. For this album, John was actually influenced by a lot of doo-wop, Beach Boys, and 60s rock. The original plan was to make an album that actually mixed and matched a bunch of, like, 60s, happy, chill-out kind of songs with a bunch of grittier, angrier punk songs, kind of to balance each other out, but in the writing and recording process, reportedly, the sunshiny stuff was just so good that they basically tossed out all the punk shit and just let this album chill out. And you know what? I'd say it's better for it. Songs like the title track, Universally Speaking, Dozed... No, I actually can't do that thing where I'm like, this song and this song and this song, to kind of lump them in a category, because like, the album as a whole is just like this. The album as a whole is just so chill, relaxed, soothing, and this record is just the whole thing, back to front, it's just vibes. It honestly almost feels like a psychedelic record but in like a good psychedelic way, you know, incense and peppermints kind of psychedelic. Smooth, dreamy, and delightful. Not... Help me! Every track on this record, even the ones that do get a little aggro, has something melodic and pleasant to it as well. It's a very major key record, but man, it just does it so well and never feels too saccharine or sunshiny. I mean, even a song like the Zephyr song. How do you listen to this and not get a big, dumb, goofy smile on your face? I mean, y'all, remember on Mother's Milk where Anthony would grumble about having to do pretty songs? shouldn't. You're really, really good at it. Ah, I mean, I kind of don't know what else to say. This isn't really what I'd call a complicated record, but it's one that just shines so well in atmosphere, mood, and feeling. The Peppers were in a good place, and they wanted to share that exuberance and happiness with the rest of us, and I'd say they did a fantastic job at it. This is probably the happiest feeling record that they would ever put out. This is basically the Uplift Mofo party plan of the Frusciante era. More on that very soon, don't worry. It's just one of those records that can instantly turn your frown upside down. If you want something that's light, fun, and whimsical, and sounds really, really good when you're high, I don't know, maybe that's the biggest reason why I love it. I don't know, maybe, judge me, Carol. But this is another one I would strongly, strongly recommend you check out. Another back to front, must hear experience. For you. Thanks for showing up to the show. Sorry I was a sick boy today, next time. Come here to squeeze your balls. Okay, now, I want to make one thing crystal clear here, okay? Just because an album falls outside of what I defined as the Pepper's sweet spot, that doesn't mean it's bad, okay? Not at all. I'd say this band doesn't have that many bad albums at all. And a personal favorite of mine outside of the sweet spot era is 1987's Uplift Mofo Party Plan. Again, super early peppers. Whew, boy, it is something else. I feel like a lot of people have forgotten about the doofy, idiot, ungabunga ass chili peppers. But, you know, I kind of understand why this era of the band gets overshadowed so much. When you rise to heights like this, it's kind of hard to look back at the other stuff with kind eyes. To an extent, I kind of get it. Early Peppers is 
going to be a hard sell for a lot of folks. But I'd argue the band really, really started to get genuinely good around this record right here. To me, this feels like the first record the band made where they are just doing their damnedest to give you the best record they can possibly record. And the main reason behind that is the vibe on this one, like by the way, is just so happy. I love, love the mood of this record. It's one of kinship, brotherhood, and renewed vigor. The original Peppers lineup of Anthony Kiedis, Flea, Jack, Irons, and Hillel Slovak was finally all back together again. Well, okay, uh, hang on a minute. Uh, story time. See, the thing you gotta know about the Chili Peppers was that initially, this band with all their success and accolades and growth and sonic development, initially, it all started as a big dumb joke. Flea, Jeremy Irons, and Hillel Slovak had a goofy jam session one night. They wrote one super quick song and had their friend Tony do an improvised rap over it, for shits and giggles mostly. But they liked it so much that they decided to talk a buddy of theirs into letting them open for one of his small club gigs one night. And I do mean small gigs. They literally played just this one song for about 30 people and then just dipped. But even after that gig, the club's manager was so impressed that he invited them back to play again, and as they say, the rest is history. I mean, looking at the earliest days of this band, you can tell they were not supposed to be taken seriously at all. Their original name was Tony Flo and the Miraculous Majestic Masters of- No. This was- really meant as more of a side project. Slovak and Irons were originally in a band called What Is This, and that was actually their main focus at the time of the Peppers' founding. So much so that when the Peppers and What Is This both got signed to different labels at around the same time, Hillel and Jeremy actually had the dip because, you know, their real band was getting successful, so they're not gonna stick around for fucking Tony Flo and his magical mystery bullshit tour. You know, it's weird to think about considering how pivotal Slovak and Irons were to the original lineup of the Peppers, but yeah, for their first two records, even though they founded the band, they weren't actually in it. So the band hired replacements for their first two records, but after tensions with Hillel's replacement, Jack Sherman, reached ahead, he was fired at around 1984. At around that same time, What Is This was also starting to lose steam, so Slovak would be able to rejoin in time for 1985's Freaky Styly. And later, their replacement drummer would also leave, allowing Jeremy Irons to come back into the fold. And it took them three albums to get there, but the original, founding, true Red Hot Chili Peppers lineup was finally together to make a real ass album. And y'all, listening to this record. <laughs> You can tell just how fucking psyched they are to be playing together again. Like, you feel it on this one. They are so happy to be there. The record just has this wonderful sense of jubilation to it. On songs like Me and My Friends, Fight Like a Brave, Backwoods, and Love Trilogy, you can literally hear how much fun they're having playing together. This might be the most raw fun on a Peppers album. This record may be pure bliss, but this one is just like pure fun. When people remember the goofy Peppers, chances are really good they're likely thinking of something off of MoFo. It feels like this is the first true Peppers album we'd ever get, and you can just see the amount of potential just dripping off of them. I feel like this was the first record where they stopped treating their success like some dumb joke that got out of hand and actually started to act like serious musicians and really devote some time to developing their craft. And it absolutely rules. It's such a fun and jovial time. Again, if you want another record that's just gonna put a huge ass smile on your face, this is the one to check out. 
I can only imagine how much of a thrill it must have been to hear this back in the day and get hyped for what was gonna come next. Like, you listen to this record and you just know this band is going to take the fuck off. It's the first album where the true original band were finally together as a whole. But sadly, it's also the only one. At around this point, the band's drug use would really start getting out of hand, and things started to fall apart dramatically while trying to tour the record. Kiedis and Hillel tried to kick their heroin addictions on tour, but Hillel had a much harder time getting clean. There were breakdowns, relapses, and even one show where they had to play without a guitarist. They were able to finish the tour, but sadly the pressure of their newfound fame would prove to be too much. Hillel Slovak would die from an overdose on June 25th, 1988. Hillel's untimely death proved to be too traumatizing for Irons to want to continue, so shortly after, he would quit the band as well. Ah, and it's so sad to think about, you know? I've heard some people say this is the only real Red Hot Chili Peppers album, and while I definitely don't agree with that, man, you listen to this record and there's a sad kind of irony to it. You hear how tightly these guys play together, how on point and focused and crazily proficient they are as a unit. You just are in awe of how well they function and you are just eager to hear what else could have come out of this particular incarnation of the guys, but sadly we never got it. You listen to a record like this and you just can't help but imagine what it might have been like had Hillel been able to conquer his demons, if the band had been able to take some time off and help him get properly clean. Imagine this amazing lineup with so much energy, life, and love for each other in music going into Rick Rubin's studio in 1989. Like, even though Mother's Milk is a fantastic record, I just cannot help but think of the alternate universe where this version of the band was allowed to bloom. And it makes me sad that they never got the chance to do so, you know? If you don't know anything about that background, this album is just a fun, fantastic little romp, but it does have a bit of a sad coda to it, despite its jubilation. But it is a fantastic peek into what this band almost was. And even with its sad background, I would still say it's more than worth your time. A lot of people like to write off early peppers, and we do have some valid criticisms going forward, but this is not a record I would look over, y'all. Give it a chance. If only for Hillel's memory, you know? <laughs> One hot minute. We're not actually going to spend a ton of time on this one because, well, we've already spent a lot of time on this one. I made a whole ass video about this record back in the day. And if you have a strong tolerance for... channel awesome level cringe, it's still watchable I guess. Let me try to give you the TLDR here. This record is a wonderfully wild little black sheep in their catalog, and I honestly don't think it gets nearly the respect it deserves. But I kinda get why it's an odd record, even for a band as odd as the Peppers. This was the first album that came out after Frashanti's first departure from the band, and people... John's exit was not an amicable one. He hadn't been handling the Pepper's newfound mega-success particularly well. That story sounds sadly familiar now that I think about it. After a meltdown in Tokyo, John abruptly left the group and the band were, yet again, down a guitarist. Enter. 
Dave Navarro. Yeah, Dave Navarro, the Ink Master guy. Yeah, even back then, Dave kind of felt like an odd choice for the group. I think that's maybe why some folks have such an uncomfortable vibe with this album. Most of the guitarist peppers up to that point had backgrounds in stuff like funk or jazz. Dave, originally coming from Jane's Addiction, <laughs> Yeah, he wasn't that. He was a much more hard, heavy shredder kind of guy. A lot of people figured his edgier style of playing wouldn't necessarily be a good fit for the Peppers. A lot of people would be wrong, because in my opinion, this album still rips. This is also arguably the heaviest the Red Hot Chili Peppers have ever been. In some ways, this album is even heavier than Mother's Milk. This thing just melts your goddamn face off. If you're the kind of person who just needs a record to be heavy, this is one worth checking out. It's also a wicked little head trip on top of things too. Songs like Warped, Coffee Shop, and Walkabout all being glorious little acid freakouts. This album is just weird and wild and partially insane. But moments where they do slow things down on tracks like My Friends and Tearjerker are also genuinely heartfelt and touching. It isn't all crazy all the time. When they do slow things down, it's pretty nice. Again, the Peppers have never been a very lyrical band, but when they really want to, yeah, they can pull on your heartstrings. You'd honestly be surprised, people. This is definitely another record that's a big personal favorite. If we were going just off of the amount I love a record, then I would easily throw this in must hears personally. It's a cute, bizarre little creature of an album. But thinking about it more critically, uh, this album is an odd duck. Nothing else they would ever put out sounds quite like this. It's heavy and mesmerizing. It is almost a metal album in places, with how twisted and dark it gets, both sonically and in subject matter. Did I mention this was the album where most of the band relapsed on hard drugs? Because this was the album where most of the band relapsed on hard drugs. I won't lie, this one gets kind of dark in places. Maybe a little too dark. I don't think a lot of Peppers fans really go in for this kind of vibe. It's a maniacal, rip-roaring, chainsawing kind of sound on this record most of the time, and... You know, it's not really a thing they would ever do again. Like, if you listen to this record as one of your very, very first, it can give you a wrong impression as to what this band is like. The Peppers were often more about melody, positivity, creating a funky, fresh vibe that everyone can bust down on. And then here's this one album that's just clouds of depression, turmoil, and a big old cloud of heroin. Again, don't get it twisted, I love this record, but, um, I'd say give the other ones a spin first, day. Eh? This album can be a little much if you're a brand spanking noob. It might just leave a scar on you if you're not careful, but it is still one I definitely love and definitely say you should check out further on down the line. The Dave Navarro era is a very controversial one, but an even more controversial era of this band, I'd say at least, would be the Klingoffer era. <laughs> Oh, Josh Klinghoffer, we hardly knew ye. Well, you were in the band for a literal decade, but it still feels like we hardly got to know the guy, doesn't it? Across a 10-year span, we only really got two records, and they are records you can certainly have an opinion about. But if I'm being 100% honest with you, I loved his debut record, I'm With You. At this stage of the Peppers, Prashanti was yet again out of the fold, though this time on much more amicable terms, thankfully. 
And I remember when they announced Klinghoffer as his replacement, the general mood was... Cautious optimism? Very cautious, in fact. Another new guitarist? Another one? Holy cow, this man goes through guitarists the way a glass table at a strip club goes through Windex. That, plus the fact that at this point, the band was coming close to 30 years of existence, and Stadium Arcadium, the previous record, did have some moments on it that felt... dozy in places were not quite there yet. Some folks were starting to feel like the band was beginning to slow down with age. Eh, you know, maybe we would just need to get ready to settle for a softer, mellower, more lethargic feeling peppers. Again, thank God most of them were wrong about that. This album isn't a one hot minute or anything, but I'm surprised at how forceful and intense it can get. Songs like Monarchy of Roses, Look Around, The Ballad of Rain Dance, Maggie, and Factory of Faith just kick absolute ass, y'all. And Flea's bass work in particular is just perfect on this record. It's the best it's probably ever sounded. Hell, his color and presence on this record hasn't been this good since Freaky Styly, in my opinion. And Chad's beats are so well punctuated and precise, even on moments where they do mellow out a bit, like Brendan's death song and Meet Me at the Corner. Everything with him is sharp and on point and absolutely precise to a T. Chad does a great job on this record. And so does Anthony. His vocals are super crisp and clean. He has really developed as a singer by this point. He is just fully on his game, pretty much. Everyone on this record gives 110%, and it really, really does show. Except... Uh, see, this... This is my biggest problem with the Klinghoffer era. Don't get it twisted. I really like Josh Klinghoffer as a guitarist. Josh is a very good guitarist. I mean, look at this. <laughs> Josh is a damn good guitarist. Let's put that debate to bed right away. He's good enough to be in this band. But, well, uh, how can I illustrate this? Um, okay, check out this random Frusciante solo. Now let's check out a Klinghoffer solo right next to it. For Shanti? Klinghoffer. Do you see what I'm getting at here? What the hell is going on? Even on these records, I wouldn't say he sounds bad. He delivers good verse grooves, interesting chorus work, and when Flea wants to take the lead, he steps back and supports him very well. He does a great job supporting the moves that the other guys make. It's just that Klinghoffer never really has any of his own moments on these records. You know, where are his big flashy moments where he can flex and show off, you know? Where's his Danny California or suck my kiss moment, you know? Where is this? <laughs> On the Klinghoffer records, Josh is not a bad guitarist, and even on these albums, I wouldn't say he's bad. He's just... fine. He's okay. He's... perfectly serviceable, and not much else. I don't know exactly what it is, but Josh just feels like such a... non-presence on a lot of the records he's on. Maybe the rest of the band just kind of wanted to ease him into things by taking on more of the weight. Maybe the chemistry just wasn't there between them. Maybe the production team talked him into stepping back. I don't know. I don't know if we'll ever know, but for whatever reason, this album and the Klinghoffer albums as a whole, I'd say, you know, even I don't want to come down so hard on it. It's still a great record, but it doesn't have the same kind of 
kick and explosive quality to it. And I feel like a big part of that is because Josh is taking such a backseat role on these records. And another very noticeable flaw on this one would definitely be the production. See, this was a 2011 record, and this was made later in Rick Rubin's career when his whole crusade for loudness was in its full swing. Even though it's good, it's not nearly as good as it should be, but even despite that, I always find myself pleasantly surprised every time I do sit with it. It's one of those records I don't go back to often, but every time I do give it another shot, I never regret spending the time with it. It's another interesting take on the Peppers sound, and one that's not necessarily characteristic of their most notable work, but again, if you want to see what some of the gems outside of their normal sound are, I would argue this is worth your time, absolutely. The other Klingoffer record, we'll get to it. <laughs> 1985's Freaky Styly. Again, even though we're in the deeper digging section of this video, this is not what I'd call a bad record. See, there are two important things you gotta remember when it comes to the Peppers catalog. The further back you go, the more rough around the edges things tend to get. And two, nine times out of ten when this band puts out a bad or even just a below average sounding record, it's usually because they were just working with the wrong producer. And the producer for this record? The first, the first thing that let me know that I wasn't crazy uh -huh. was when I first saw you on television. I'm not kidding. They got the godfather of funk himself, George Clinton, in to help make this record. And that combination probably sounds weird as hell if all you're familiar with is this band's later work, but you also have to remember, these guys started out as more of a funk and hip-hop infused thing. Rock was just one of the many things they did. On paper at least, Clinton actually makes a lot of sense. He sure as hell beat their original choice, which was... Okay, welcome to the Anarchist Cookbook. How do we dress a generation who's bored? Yeah, no joke. The band were originally in talks to have noted Sex Pistols manager Malcolm McLaren to produce, but when he suggested that the band play more simplified 1950s style rock and roll, yeah, the band promptly said fuck that. God, imagine what that version of the Peppers would have sounded like. It's such an odd little animal. And the thing is, I'd argue the biggest thing it has going against it actually is Clinton's production here. This record is easily the closest to raw funk the Peppers would ever get, so if that's your jam, this might be up your alley. But like, that's... See, that's kind of the problem with this record. It just sounds like a generic funk record. It's not really a Red Hot Chili Peppers album, per se. Dare I say it, it almost sounds like a George Clinton solo record by way of the Red Hot Chili Peppers. You know what I mean? There's just not a lot of actual peppers on this Red Hot Chili Peppers record. And truth be told, Clinton just does not know how to highlight these guys' strengths. Except for Flea. I mean, he brings out the best in Flea. His bass sounds fucking magnificent on this record. But, you know, a funk legend is gonna know how to make the low end work. Everything else on this album, though... Yeah, Kiedis' vocals are pushed so far in the back you can barely hear him at all. And poor Hillel Slovak. God, again, it's such a tragedy. We never got to hear a Slovak record with good production. Ugh. Oh. Just imagine Slovak on a record that actually sounds good. I'll quit harping on it. Clinton just wasn't a good fit for these guys. At least it sounded like they had fun making this record. That much I'll give them. Maybe a little too much fun? Uh, 
stories about how the band and George partied while making this record are pretty notorious. The entire album was basically made on an entire mountain of cocaine. Fun fact, the guy who's saying, look at that turtle go. Look at that turtle go, bro. Yeah, that guy, that guy is apparently George Clinton's drug dealer. George owed him a big debt at the time. Hey, mountains of cocaine don't pay for themselves. And George couldn't afford to pay him. So as collateral, he literally let him have a cameo on the album. I think that should tell you all you need to know about the atmosphere behind this record. You know, it's not a bad album necessarily, but it is kind of a scatterbrained mess. But even with its sloppiness, the original spark that made the Peppers great, though, yeah, this album is basically just George Clinton using the Peppers as a proxy to make more funk and do all the cocaine. But even through the haze of bass lines and booger sugar, you still get a feel for just how capable the band would become in later years. I mean, the talent and raw skill is there. It's just not terribly developed yet. And if I'm being painfully honest, there are parts of this record <laughs> really didn't age well. See, this is what happens when you let a bunch of idiot teenagers do cocaine with George Clinton. Zero out of ten, wouldn't recommend. Can we please move on? Ah, now this is a bit more like it. Stadium Arcadium, the last Red Hot Chili Peppers album to feature John Frusciante. For a while, anyway. An absolute juggernaut of a double album from one of the band's best lineups during one of their most successful periods. Honestly, a record that deserves a lot of high praise. So why the hell am I putting this on Deeper Digging? Well, this is why I stress and overstress that how to get into's are about accessibility, not necessarily personal love. If an album is lower, lower on this list, it doesn't mean I hate it. In fact, I really, really love Stadium Arcadium. Honestly, this record has some of the best cuts the Peppers would ever put out. Danny California is a wonderfully peppy, high energy little number. Other slam jams like Snow, Tell Me Baby, Ready Made, and Torture Me are raucous and savage and have some of Frusciante's most colorful and most proficient guitar work yet. And even slower numbers like Desecration Smile, Hard to Concentrate, Slow Cheetah, and the fantastic title track are all super chill little escapades that help create a balanced and flavorful mood. Prashanti was actually inspired a great deal by prog music on this outing. He even went as far as to layer a lot of the guitar melodies, and it results in this very, very rich overall sound. Also, the vibe that I enjoyed so much on By The Way carries over a bit to this record as well. Everyone is just happy and carefree and working absolutely terrific with each other. The interband chemistry was just running at an absolute peak, and again, you can totally hear it on this record. It makes me want to be charitable to it, you know? It's not a bad record at all. It's fantastic. Except for one thing. You know what I'm about to say, too, if you know this record. How to get into is about accessibility and people. This record is too damn long. I'm sorry, it is! It is and you know it is! Booing me only makes me more right! One of the biggest general criticisms you can make about the Pepper's discography is that many of the albums are already kinda on the lengthy side, often coming close to or eclipsing a whole hour. Stadium Arcadium? Two hours and two minutes. Jesus, that is a lot of time to devote to California and pussy. And the scary thing is, the album was almost even longer than that. The final record is 28 songs, but the band originally recorded 38. 
this was originally going to be a triple album. Look, I don't care how much you love Californian Pussy, that is way too many goddamn songs about Californian Pussy. To be fair though, the original plan was to release these songs as three separate albums gradually over the span of about two years or so. It would have been more like a stadium arcadium suite of records. Upon reflection, it was probably a good idea they didn't try that. I, people, there's just no excuse for it. This album is too damn big. It just is. I'd say between the two discs, Jupiter and Mars, there's probably one full record's worth of fantastic material. Maybe even like an album and a really banging EP, if I'm being generous. But this thing easily, easily has the most filler out of any other of their records. It's just padded to shit, people. And the sad part too is no one can agree on what the filler tracks are. I mean that. You ask two separate Peppers fans about Stadium Arcadium, you'll get five different answers on what the best tracks are. I can't even pretend to give you a guide on how to tackle this one. Well, I've seen people honest to God defend Hump de Bump. I mean, really, that's the only thing that prevents me from flat out recommending this one. It's crushing length. Hell, even though I like this album, I almost never sit through the whole thing back to front if I put it on. Just because, like, People, I love cookies too, but if I eat an entire bag of Chips Ahoy, I get sick by the end of it, you know? I'd still definitely recommend you give it a try, if only so you can find out what your favorite tracks are. Oof, but y'all, take this one in like chunks or something. One sitting with this record? I'm a Red Hot Chili Peppers super fan, and even I think it's too much for me, you know what I mean? It's just... A lot is a lot, and this record has a lot. The parts about this record I do love, though, I adore. But to me, it is the definitive album where you listen to it and you just go, good, skip, good, good, skip, 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 good, good, skip, good, skip, good, 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 skip, good, skip, 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 good, you know? And here we go with the Proceed With Caution picks. Let's start off simply, shall we? The self-titled debut. Whoo boy. This is one of those debut records that just... reeks of green. As mentioned in the Uplift Mofo segment, Slovak and Irons were away playing for their real band. So the band hired drummer Cliff Martinez and guitarist Jack Sherman to fill in for them, kind of at last notice. And, well, uh, okay, here's the thing. Sherman's playing is debated amongst a lot of Red Hot Chili Peppers fans. He was definitely a talented guy, he understood how to create a funky riff, and even Kiedis has stated that his early influence was a driving factor in what helped push the Peppers in their funky, more bombastic direction. He was helpful in that regard, but, um, mm. In practice, he's just a little sloppy on this record is all. In fact, the whole band sounds really, really sloppy. I mean, that's basically this record in an entire nutshell. It's just sloppy in composition and production. The band definitely feels like they have no idea what they're trying to do on this record. But I mean, given that this band originally started as a big dumb joke, you know, I get why that is. It makes sense why this album turned out so slipshod. If early peppers are rough around the edges, this is easily the roughest. And that's another thing about this record too. Anthony is basically not singing at all yet. Not at this point. He would rap, he would scat, he would yell, but he's not really singing yet. And like, Again, this just sounds horribly dated. You can see them trying to fuse all these different genres together like they would in later years, but 
If later albums are, say, a smooth jar of Nutella, then this record is definitely a big old jar of goober grape. You can just feel the clunkiness on this album. Like, it is clunk-tastic. It's also, like a lot of their worst records, not a very well-produced album. Again, nine times out of ten, if a Peppers record is bad, it's because they got the wrong producer attached to it. And this record? Oh my god, Andy Gill is slowly becoming my arch nemesis on this channel, and the motherfucker's been dead for two years! On paper, this decision actually made a lot of sense. Gang of Four were one of the original trailblazers when it came to blending punk, funk, and soul in the late 70s and early 80s. I mean, if you've got a band that's trying to do the funk rock thing, yeah, he was one of the innovators of that genre. It seems like he'd be a good fit, but... He basically just used the Peppers to make something that tried to sound like Gang of Four. Which, again, makes sense on paper. I see where your head is at there, but Gang of Four and the Red Hot Chili Peppers were two very different bands that put out two very, very different vibes. The sparse, striking, and socially conscious bravado of stuff like entertainment or solid gold really doesn't vibe well against... You know? Andy's mix on this one just feels cold and sterile. It drains all the vibrance and energy out of their sound. And this is a band that needs vibrance and energy to survive, at least at this stage, you know? Not to mention, like with Beinhorn for Mother's Milk, there was definitely tension between the two parties. Apparently, Andy was an absolute chore to work with, often being either apathetic or outright hostile to the rest of the band. The most notorious incident being Anthony finding Andy's notes on the mixing desk. Next to Police Helicopter, a song that they considered one of their best at the time, was a single note. Shit. Can't they print Where that? Why they, they yeah, print that's that? That's not real, is it? You can't print that. At that moment, the band basically drew a line in the sand, and it became Andy versus the band. And chaos ensued because of it. And man, you really can't hear it on this record. Andy just sucked all of the life out of this mix, and the album definitely suffers a lot for it. And you know how I know that? Because their original demos sound so much better. The original demo tape that some of these songs come from is better than the actual record. Uh, the remastered versions of this album that came out a few years back include a lot of the stuff from those original demo tapes and yeah, this totally slaps. Where the hell is this on the album? Uh, you know what? Fuck it, I'm putting a caveat on this. The OG record, that stays in Proceed With Caution, but the self-titled demos? Fuck it, I'm putting those in deeper digging. These songs, they had potential. They had the ability to sound much better. I don't despise the album, but it's just a very frustrating listen. But even with all its problems, there is some charm to be found. It's a record I can't really recommend to folks, but I at least understand why it sounds the way it does. This is a classic case of first album syndrome. The guys aren't comfortable in their own skin yet. They're working with people who don't get what they're going for. The self-titled is a rough record, but I at least understand and empathize with why it sounds the way it does. You know, I get why that album is the way it is. The Getaway, on the other hand... Like, I barely have anything to say at all about this record. Um, in one word... Boring. This is another one I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on, because... Yeah, I've already reviewed it before. 
looking back on the old videos where I did mention this record, whereas the last album had really big, jumping, thrusting centerpieces like Monarchy of Roses, Factory of Faith, and Look Around, this album has... I still feel more or less the same, y'all. The band originally planned to release their follow-up to I'm With You a few years later after that album dropped. They even wrote 20 to 30 songs to turn into a proper I'm With You follow-up, and then Flea broke his arm in a snowboarding accident and had to spend a really long time in recovery. Also during that time, for whatever reason, the band decided to move away from working with longtime producer and unofficial fifth pepper by this point, Rick Rubin. Y'all, it's another classic case of the Peppers going in with another producer and coming out with something not so great. Enter Danger Mouse. Too much? I have no beef with Danger Mouse or anything. He's done work that I have enjoyed. He's produced a lot of fantastic records, honestly. But... Again, he was just not the right guy for the job. Hell, the band all but gave him a record to produce for them. Like I said, they had 20, 30 songs already basically written, and he told them to chuck the whole thing and start from scratch. But, uh, a few highlights. Dark Necessities is a slithery little bop. I do enjoy that one. Encore is definitely a nice, pretty little slow burn. This Ticonderoga is the closest thing this album has to an energetic track. But outside of those, like, three songs... <laughs> this record, it's just so moody, tepid, and horribly lethargic. Danger Mouse, again, just does not know how to bring out the best in these guys. Flea's bass, one of the most important and pivotal parts of the Pepper's sound, it's chucked way, way too far in the back to where you can barely hear Flea's bass on a Pepper's record. Anthony's vocals are recorded in a way that's very stilted and stiff, and Josh Klinghoffer, ugh. God, again, it just feels like he's not doing anything. But to his credit for this one, it feels more like a case of them not giving him anything to work with. I mean, Danger Mouse definitely contributed to this album being what it is, but I'd say the band are equally culpable here as well. For some reason, they went with a much more smooth jazz and loungy feel. Uh, for a Peppers record? Uh, yeah, no, I ain't into that. I mean, there are a lot of pretty melodies here. There's some nice serene arrangements. For an album that's slow, it at least knows how to tackle slowness and gentleness and subduedness appropriately. <laughs> Nah, I'm sorry, I just wanted to make sure you were still awake. I know some folks definitely have a soft spot for this one, but in my opinion... Oh, th again, this is a hard record to even talk about. I barely have anything to say about it. It's just really sleepy and boring and droll. If you are the type of person who likes when the Peppers turn things down a notch, honestly, this has the potential to be your favorite Peppers album. Because that's literally all it is. But, you know, even... Under those circumstances, I'd sooner point you to something like By The Way or Stadium Arcadium. If you need something to put on the background when you study, or if you just want to hear some random babbling about California to help put you to sleep at night, this record does the trick, I guess, but... Uh, I guess Dark Necessities is fine, I'll give you that much, but I ain't budging an inch further, I'm sorry, folks. Even this record does have things I do enjoy about it, or at the very least can respect to a degree. Again, this is a band capable of going to some very strange, unusual, but almost always delightful places. The Peppers are a band that can do goofball idiot shit, warm, thoughtful tunes, introspective and earnest melodies, and almost 
anything and everything in between and do it pretty damn well. They're a band that has been beset on all sides by turmoil, tragedy, and strife. And while 99% of other acts would fall by the wayside under all that pressure, under all that chaos, not only have they survived for close to four decades, but they've made some of the greatest music of all time while doing it. And with a new record on the way, and a reunion with both Frusciante and Ruben coming over the horizon, I'd say we're in for even more surprises further down the line. And I honestly can't wait. As for my thoughts on Unlimited Love and where it potentially falls on this spectrum, Patreon exclusive. Anybody seen this?